name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I'm an addictions doctor working out of Toronto, Canada. And today I want to talk about one of the biggest obstacles that a person in new recovery has when they come into treatment, the spiritual side of AA. And I want to tell you about another way to reinterpret that, biological way to reinterpret that. When a person enters treatment for their alcoholism or their drug addiction, very good chance that they will be introduced to the AA program, Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a program that was started by Bill W. and Dr. Bob. Of course, there are other modalities. There's contingency management, there's behavioral modification, just straight out therapy, a psychodynamic therapy. There's medication assisted treatment, many different approaches towards treating alcoholism, but you can't get away from the very strong influence of AA because it was the first treatment for alcohol addiction and then later other addictions. It's a very available treatment program that if you can find a way to use it, it can be greatly to your benefit. It's free and it's highly available. Here's the problem. A lot of people who are introduced to AA or some version of AA, like Narcotics Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, have the same format. And one of the biggest problems is that people go into a meeting and they go, whoa, there's so much of this God thing. I don't like the God thing. I'm not a religious person and I can't, I can't abide by this. What I would like to suggest to you that rather than throw out the baby with the bathwater, and what we will say in the program of AA is, take what you can and leave the rest. How you can take what you can and leave the language that you don't like, because there is another way to reinterpret this spiritual program aspect. There's no word that the word God and higher power and the spiritual focus is in AA. There's no question about that. And most long timers, people who have been sober for a very long time, will say that it in fact was the spiritual aspect that kept them sober. Yes, it might have been the medical aspect that got them sober day one. It might have been the psychological aspect that got them to year three or year four, but what got them and kept them in on year five and year 10 was the spiritual aspect. And here's a graph by the National Institute of Drugs and Alcohol in the US that actually shows that if a person could make it to year one, chances are that they would have a higher, higher rate of success in year two. And if they made it to year two, good chance they would make it to year three. So the longer that they stayed in the program, like there you are, if you look at uh, year four, almost 80% of people who are at year four will most likely make it to year five. So whatever it is that's keeping people in and is keeping them sober and clean, that's really important. And most people will say, hey, that is the spiritual aspect. But don't worry, because there's another way you can, you can reinterpret this. How I'm going to do that, I'm going to first of all introduce you to the first three steps. That's the focus of this particular talk. So the first step is I admit that I'm powerless over alcohol and that my life has become unmanageable. Step one. And alcohol or the drug of choice is prominent. Step two, came to believe in a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity. Ah, there it is, the word higher power. It used to be God, Bill W actually scratched that out and said we better call it higher power because people won't like the God thing. Even in 1939, he knew that was going to be a problem. Uh, so that's step two. And then step three, made a decision to turn my life and my will over to the care of God or a higher power. So. The concept of God is in the first three steps twice. Let me now talk a little bit about the biology of addiction, and then I'm going to show you how you can uh, reinterpret the three steps. You, we can see the brain as being divided into three parts. The lower part, which is uh, where on my face is here, where my body is, that's, that's the lower part which regulates breathing and function and digestion and consciousness. I, I don't need to be aware of it. That's just my body doing its job. I don't need to think about it. The second part of the brain, we often call that the limbic system. And that is where our reward is, our memory is, our motivation is, and that's where the addiction sits, controls us uh, when we are in addiction mode. The, the top of the image, that cortex, 
the frontal lobe, the higher order functioning of the brain. And it's a fairly newly evolved part of the brain. You need to know about this, that in terms of power, now this is not your choice. This is just how we are wired. The bottom part of the brain has the most power because it's the part, I don't have any power. I don't, if I, I breathe, whether I want to or not, then second most powerful is the limbic system or the middle part of the brain, where our motivation is, our instinct is, our memory, our reward pathway, our moods, behavior uh, comes from this. Essentially, that middle part of the brain serves to keep me alive. It, in a way, serves the lower part, which is life. It's me, reptilian brain, doing my thing without thinking. And then this middle part of the brain allows me to think, but just in the sense of, I want to do this and that will keep me alive. And I don't want to do that because that threatens my life that's it then the third part of the brain the top part the the more newly evolved part of our brain this is where our higher order thinking is this is where cooperation is this is where willpower is our judgment is this is in a part of the brain that is the least powerful it's the weakest link on the chain it does not have the same power as the middle part and it certainly does not have the same power as the lower part Willpower is in the frontal lobe, which is in that higher order part, the top part of our brain, it has maybe 20 minutes of power for the whole day. It has some power. It's meant to moderate my instinctual behavior so that if I want something from you, I'm not just going to push you aside and grab it. I'm actually going to, first of all, use my diplomatic skills, my empathic skills, cooperate with you so that I can get what I want. And then if I really want it and you're not cooperating, eventually, 20 minutes later, when my willpower is gone, I'm just going to go and get it. So I have some level of power, not very much. So it's there, but not very powerful. Where the power really sits is in the middle part of the brain, which is where the addiction is. So step one, came to admit that I am powerless over my addiction and that my life has become unmanageable. I am powerless over where my addiction sits, which is in that dopamine, urgic reward pathway center. And I have no power except maybe 20 minutes in a day to deal with that. I admit that I'm powerless. And if I think I can manage, which is the second part of that uh, step, that means that I still think I have some power to control myself. But after 20 minutes, I don't have that power anymore. So this is just a biological fact. I do not have power over my addiction when it is in full swing. It's the same as I don't have power over my behavior when I am really mad. If I am so angry for, for the first 20 minutes, I'm going to be saying, Vera, don't say anything. You know, I'm talking to the pharmacist who just doesn't understand the, my, my handwriting on the script and I'm getting more and more frustrated. I've got 20 minutes to say, okay, you better hang up and you better stay away because in 20 minutes you're going to blow up and yell at them, which of course would not be a good thing. Ultimately, I don't have power over my behavior. Now, how we learn how to have power is in the same way as we learn how to deal with addiction, we make sure we're not in circumstances where we're gonna be blowing up all the time. Uh, in other words, stress management and uh, learning how to set boundaries learning how to basically do self-care. And then when we're in a circumstance, then we learn how to, in that 20 minutes that we have, get out of the circumstance so that we don't blow. And that's the same with addiction. You learn the triggers and the cues and don't put yourself into those situations. And then when you are in those situations, well, you've got 20 minutes to get yourself out of them and get help. So that's step one. I am powerless and I admit that. And so recovery is about what do I do given that scenario? Step two, being to believe in a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity. Okay, that sounds pretty religious, but I'm going to ask you to consider it this way. Came to believe that there is another power, not me, because I don't have any power right now, but another power that can help me. Now that other power is anything. It can be the person in the room. It can be the circumstances. Basically, what you're acknowledging is that I am not the only person in the universe right now. There may be another perspective that I cannot see right now because you won't be able to see it. Now, you'll be able to see it in a few hours or maybe in a few years. Later, when you're out of the situation, you'll go, whoa, was I ever out to lunch at that particular time? But at that moment, you are focused only on yourself and you don't see that there's another perspective. So all we're asking you to do, it came to believe that there's a power greater than myself, is just came to believe that there's another perspective than the one that I have right now. Three, 
gave my will and my life over to the care of God. Okay, sounds very religious. And if you're okay with that, it'll work. The thing about the 12-step program, and in fact, many treatment programs, is you don't really have to believe them. If you do them, they'll work. Now, why does it work? Because what you're actually doing on step three is you're surrendering your will. It doesn't matter who it is to, just not to yourself, because yourself is engaged in the addict mind, which is going to do something that you really don't want to be doing. A term that they use often is self-will run riot. Uh, and you don't want to have self-will run right because it's going crazy and it's going to hurt you it's quote insane so you want to be restored to sanity you want to get out of that insane place that highly focused place with another perspective but in order to do that first of all you have to recognize that there's another perspective that's step two and then step three you now have to surrender to it that's a very hard thing to do those of us who don't like surrender we don't want to do that. We don't want to give in control and our sense of perspective to somebody else. However, if you recognize that you actually don't see what's going on, and then you take the courageous step, this is the courage to say, I don't know what the other perspective is because I'm in tunnel vision right now, but I know that mine is not right. And I'm going to follow this other person who might be a sponsor or another person in the meeting or just the slogan uh, that the 12 step will uh, spout. Um, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to surrender to something that I don't intuitively know in this moment to get myself out of that tunnel vision. I really want to emphasize that this requires courage. This requires the courage to give up your own will, your own sense of what you think you need to do and take a chance that you might be wrong and that there might be a better way. That's what we call belief. Core piece of the AA program is the concept of surrender and belief in something better, which we call the higher power. So here I am using terms like recognizing that I'm powerless. Yes, I'm powerless over the drug, which is in that middle part of the brain, which is more powerful than my willpower after 20 minutes. Two, recognizing that in that moment, I don't have the perspective, the larger, broader, different perspective. All I have is the perspective that will keep me using my drug or alcohol. And then the third, that I am going to give up the chance, give up my own will and give that other perspective a chance. So that's steps one, two, three. And it's premised on a fundamental understanding of the biology of how the brain and addiction works. You don't have to give up AA if you don't like the spiritual God part.